So the three areas we're going to cover today, uh, first and foremost, what are the consumer finance habits we're seeing right now? Um, we talk about the rise of finfluencers, which is essentially influencers in the financial services um, and financial space overall. The younger generation, they're spending all their time on their phone. And when they're on their phone, they're looking at content from social media. And most of that social media content now is coming from other consumers or influencers versus traditional mediums. So uh, we continue to see the rise of the creator economy and the impact of individuals and other people. And the financial services space um, is not immune to that. You're seeing many um, new rising influencers in the financial services space, and um, they carry a lot of weight and influence amongst the broad consumer base. And then lastly, how can finance brands um, connect with consumers? How can they leverage their trust and brand equity in this space to help consumers along the way while building their business at the same time. So um, the first thing we're gonna be talking about is consumer finance habits. And um, of course, consumers have a relationship with money that um, over time certainly ebbs and flows, but we found that 73% of the consumers that we spoke to generally consider their uh, relationship with money uh, to be healthy. Um, and because of that, and they, because they feel they have a healthy relationship with money, they plan on continuing spending. Um, and, you know, if you go on an airplane, if you go to Disney World, if you go to Coachella this weekend, there it's going to be packed, right? And you're not going to see uh, consumers that are fearful, fearful of an um, economic downturn. You're going to be consume, uh, see consumers who have their foot on the gas of their spending. That's sort of the general theme that I see across the board is consumers have their foot on the board, uh, foot, foot on the gas in spending. And what's interesting is, Last year in running a tech startup, you certainly saw a downturn in B2B spending. Um, you saw many tech companies uh, initiate massive layoffs and very well-off tech companies, you, you know, the Metas of the world and um, and the Googles and Microsofts, they all did either hiring freezes or layoffs. And these are the wealthiest companies in the world. And that kind of had a trickle down impact on the B2B landscape, on the business world. And you saw many venture funded startups go out of business and venture capital funding dry up. And many people thought that the next shoe to drop here in 2024, myself included, was going to be the consumer. Like ultimately this um, halt and slowdown in business spending is going to trickle down and impact the end consumer. And again, it really hasn't yet. And although we saw a lot of layoffs, especially at the beginning of 2023, that really hasn't continued, nor has that filtered down from the tech space to more traditional businesses, whether it be uh, big box retailers or airlines or um, or government organizations, et cetera. We have not really seen layoffs in those sectors. It was largely um, you know, siloed um, with big tech companies. Doesn't mean there weren't other larger companies that did do layoffs, but you know, 2023 really was scary the way it kicked off. And to date, it really hasn't impacted the unemployment rate at all. Um, six in 10 consumers rate their financial well-being as good um, or excellent. Again, that is how they see themselves. Um, it's not necessarily how maybe a financial advisor would would call their financial well-being. But generally speaking, more consumers than not feel like their financial well-being is in a decent place. And I kind of touched upon this earlier. Um, and this is an article that just came out a couple of weeks ago that COVID changed how we spend um, with more what's called YOLO splurging, but less saving. And, you know, one thing we're starting to see right now, and it was just announced last month that credit card debt in the United States surpassed a trillion dollars. And that was the first time that that's happened, is that many consumers have established a lifestyle for themselves coming out of COVID, again, largely driven by this fiscal stimulus that occurred across the board. And when you start to get into those habits where you're going to buy Starbucks coffee a couple of times a week, or you're going on a vacation a couple of times a year, or you expect to get the new iPhone on every cycle, or you expect to get a new car after every three month, three year lease is done, you know, ultimately those lifestyle habits become hard to change. And what consumers start to do, and, and this has been proven throughout history, is once the money starts to dry up, they don't necessarily instantly change their lifestyle habits. They say, you know, old habits die hard. What instead they do is they start dipping into credit. They start increasing their credit card balances. Uh, maybe they're going to take out an extra um, home equity uh, line of credit to help support that lifestyle they've established for themselves that they're really not ready to part with. And that's why I believe you're starting to see these credit card um, rates um, really stack up. And 
you know, and what's starting to happen is the credit card companies are saying, we're going to increase the rates and they're probably starting to see more defaults and it can create a little bit of a, um, of a tough situation for consumers in the wake of rising interest rates, because all this debt they're taking out, whether it be from credit cards or home equity line of credits become more and more expensive. And, you know, we all know that, um, you know, money has a way of really accumulating both positively and negatively. And when it comes to debt, it can really stack up quickly. Um, and I think this kind of YOLO spending that we're seeing from consumers, especially when it comes to, revenge travel like you know during covid so many young consumers were stuck in a the house they weren't able to travel they weren't able to go to concerts and sporting events etc and now all of a sudden they have the ability to and they are still i don't know if i call it doom spending but i think yolo splurging is probably a better way to put it um they are not holding back and we saw last year the taylor swift concert tour which is actually heading to this summer as well generate, you know, over a billion dollars in, in concert revenue. And, and there was talk about how Taylor Swift's concerts really was a boom to local economies. That's because of the massive demand um, that's occurred. Um, and it's not just superstars like at the top, like Taylor Swift, but really any big concert that happens in, in a major market, the prices are something that would be really unfathomable in a pre-COVID era. So this YOLO splurging it is a thing. Um, and for many businesses, it's a great thing because they're the recipients of all the spending. But I think there is also an opportunity for financial education and financial literacy along with all this. It's funny because although six in 10 consumers say they're in a good financial space, nearly half are still stressed about their finances. And that's sort of where the dichotomy lives, right? Because if you are really in a good financial space and your relationship with money is really good, then you probably aren't stressed about your finances. And I think this is sort of that underlying concern that consumers have that maybe the good times aren't going to last forever. Maybe I should start saving more. Maybe I need to relook at my budget. And we certainly haven't seen that start to happen yet, at least not to the level I'd expect um, at this point. Um, so we asked consumers what their top financial wellness habits are. Uh, you know, nearly half said they're saving monthly. 44% um, are saying they're spending less than they earn. Um, which means that more than half are spending more than they are in each month, hence the rising credit card rates. Um, and 40% are checking bank accounts daily. You know, um, there was a tool that still exists, but I think it's in its last legs now called Mint. Um, that was a, a tool by the company Intuit that shut down. Um, and I've been using Mint really for the last 15 years to really track and categorize every expense that I made. Um, and I found it to be an incredible tool to be able to check you know, how much I was saving, how much I was spending, how my investments are doing. And once Mint kind of went out of business or didn't go out of business, they just got shut down by the company because Intuit's doing fine. Um, there wasn't many options for an app, surprisingly, that tracked your spending and gave you the analytics the way that Mint did. And I would have thought that there'd be so many other tools out there. And I think this is a huge opportunity um, for banks to really create an app that has great data visualization, that's easy to use, that has um, intuitive reporting and, and AI-driven insights that allow consumers to see how much money they're spending, what the cost of that spending is, what the cost of the interest is. Um, there's not really that much out there in that regard. And I think it's such a huge opportunity for financial institutions to create more lock-in and add more value to consumers. I would argue an app like that provides way more value than having a physical banking location on Main Street. Because most con most consumers, when you're talking about millennials, Gen Z, they don't really wanna go to a bank. They don't really wanna pick up the phone. What they really wanna do is check their app and see how much money they have and see what financial products may be available to them. And if I were running a large banking institution, I would shut down 80% of my retail banking locations and invest all that money in an incredible digital experience for consumers that really provided them with all the financial literacy and financial management tools that they would need because it would create tremendous lock-in effect for the bank and also give them the opportunity to sell them in new products based upon the data you would have from that app. So when you use an app like Mint, you can actually see the, the app provider, how consumers are spending, how much interest they're spending on um, their credit cards, how much they're spending on their car insurance, for example, what their mortgage interest rate is. You have all this information from consumers, not just as it relates to your bank, 
but all the other institutions that they work with, because you're essentially pulling all this information in. So I think it's just such a massive opportunity um, because consumers are going to spend a lot more time on their phone than they are in your banking location. Um, and I think that's kind of should be the new place that many financial institutions look at for the next realm of innovation. We ask consumers what their, um, you know, choice for number one choice for financial activities. Um, Bank of America was the number one choice uh, for consumers in terms of trust. Um, Bank of America has obviously done a great job as a bank institution um, with consumers, younger consumers and very digitally savvy um, institution. And that was the bank that came up first uh, for consumers. What are they spending on? So you see this shift here uh, with COVID and you obviously, I spoke about this earlier in terms of services and services could be hotels, it could be airlines, um, it could be a lot of leisure based activities that consumers did and that dropped off a cliff in 2020. Um, and then you saw a massive rebound um, in 2021 and, you know, I'm looking at the black line here and you can see that that line far exceeded the spending than, it, than we saw in 2019, 2018, 2017. So the, the spend in services went from record lows to massive highs, and it's leveled off at a place that's higher than where we were pre-pandemic. So it has changed consumers. It has had made consumers rethink the way they spend money, and a lot of them have said, I'm going to spend more um, on services. Of course, we saw a massive peak in durables, which is the green line, uh, you know, during the pandemic. Durables are washing machines, um, durables are refrigerators, and durables are televisions. One thing I remember um, through some of our past daily consumer webinars is consumers would buy a television for every room and bathroom in the house um, during COVID because they were there and they just wanted to buy TVs. And then what started to happen post-pandemic is they start to stack up at these big box retailers because the inventory was just too much. Um, and consumers at a certain point didn't need any more TVs, right? So you saw a massive drop off in spending of durables. Laptops is another place where consumers spent so much money on um, in, you know, in, in the COVID era. And a lot of that, you know, kind of dropped off to a level when it comes to durables that never really recovered in to the pre-COVID spending. So you had services you know, basically end at an all time high, you know, far, surpe far surpassing the pre COVID spending. And then you had durables actually really never recover, um, you know, to those peaks during COVID, which is really interesting. Um, and now what you're starting to see, and this is a forecast by Deloitte, that's kind of all leveling off in terms of the spend between uh, durables, non durables, and services uh, for consumers. But it certainly points to a revival in the experience economy um, and how consumers really are prioritizing that um, over all else. Um, you know, we spoke about this earlier, but consumer spending confidence uh, very much could be the result of a strong labor market. Um, the economy continues to add jobs at, at a record clip, um, adding over 300,000 jobs um, in the March label report. Um, and unemployment falling to 3.8%. Um, so the labor market is incredibly strong. Um, I would argue in some spaces, we are starting to see some headwinds driven by AI, uh, especially in the in the technology space. You know, I mentioned Meta who cut 18,000 um, jobs during the year 2023 and still was able to increase profits uh, 40%. So, you know, you are seeing some Techno technically savvy and technically sufficient companies looking at AI as a way where they can do more automation, do more offshoring, and, and is putting pressure on jobs. But that does seem pretty isolated right now. Um, it's not like AI is starting to take people's jobs right away, clearly through this low um, labor market. It's something I would watch um, in in the year ahead because AI is so nascent right now. It's a technology. There's still so much to be learned about it. And I do think, um, especially if some of these financial pressures do play out in consumers with rising debt, that they may see less demand. And as a result, they may want to cut their costs. And AI could be a place that, that some of these companies look at to do so. But again, not all industries can use AI to cut costs. And um, it's going to be interesting for sure to see how that all plays out. Um, so I spoke earlier about Finfluencers, which is basically, and I didn't come up with that name, but um, that's what it's called, uh, and and the rise of financial services influencers. And, um, you know, it's what is a Finfluencer? It's a social media influencer who specializes in finance tips, uh, particularly money management tips. Um, and about a third of the consumers we spoke to use social media to learn about financial matters. 
And sometimes this will come in consumers' feeds um, in terms of a meme. Sometimes it'll be an influencer that's sharing a video. Sometimes it could just be an infographic um, or a stat. Um, you know, what we saw also coming out of, uh, of COVID is, is obviously the rise of crypto. And, you know, Bitcoin has had its uh, share of peaks and valleys for sure over the past four to five years. But um, when you look at something like crypto, when you look at something like the whole GameStop phenomenon and platforms like Robinhood, um, one thing we've definitely seen post COVID is more consumer interest in um, taking advantage of some more speculative types of um, financial tools like crypto, um, as well as consumers looking at the gamification of financial services in a way that ultimately makes them more interested. Like when you look at Robinhood, it's a trading tool like we've never seen before throughout history. Like when you look at stock trading tools the way they used to be, they looked like something that would be in the part of a Bloomberg terminal, right? And it looked like it was something that was really built for Wall Streeters. When, when Robinhood came out, um, it really was the first thing that almost made stock trading look like a video game. So I think all those phenomenons really have made consumers, especially younger consumers, more attuned to the markets, more attuned to what's going on, um, you know, with the economy. And because of that, they are probably more likely to engage in this type of content in social media. It's not saying it's really disconnected from the daily persona anymore, maybe the way it used to be. Um, so consumers are also learning about financial matters via other online channels. Uh, 23% um, are learning about financial matters over podcasts, um, and 20% are through finance and software apps, which is kind of the big opportunity um, I had just spoken about. Um, and 7 in 10 are trusting advice from financial influencers. So these financial influencers are carrying weight. Many trust these influencers more so than the big institutions or their banks uh, because they feel like they've developed a relationship with these people and they feel like that these people are speaking to them in their language. And it's just interesting how this is kind of a whole new vertical that's then birthed from the creator economy. Um, TikTok influencers, obviously, and, and all types of influencers often aren't the experts they, they claim to be. And as is anything else in social media, it's sort of like content consumer beware. Um, this is an article from Rolling Stone that shows TikTok influencers promise they'll make you rich, but the math doesn't add up. And you see that all the time. You see people come up with these videos that are very clickbaity, but anyone who knows you know, uh, anything about what they're talking about could say, well, that doesn't really make sense. That's a scheme. That's something that has holes in it. And it's definitely a cautionary tale for younger consumers who are maybe looking for, in this YOLO-driven economy, an easy way out, that not everything you see on platforms like TikTok are necessarily true or real. And you have to have a healthy degree of skepticism about anything you see. Um, you know, th there's a variety of different um, influencers, and, and, and many of them come from the actual finance community. So um, like Humphrey Yang and, and, and others who, um, who come from... Um, whether the past analysts or they work for private equity firms or they came came from traditional financial institutions have have saw opportunities to become um, finfluencers and, and 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 use those platforms and use their ability to create content to really build completely new business models uh, for consumers. Um, surprisingly, nearly half of of consumers we spoke to made financial decisions based upon influencer advice. I mean, it's just millennials aren't kids anymore. You know, millennials were the first uh, generation to grow up with the internet in the household. Gen Z, the first generation to grow up with the mobile device in the household. Millennials are now the parents and the CFOs of the household. So, you know, they're not the the uh, people who are playing Xbox and eating Doritos and ordering pizza anymore. This is the mom or the dad of a three family household, and they are they are the people who grew up with the internet in the household. Those are the people who are getting their advice when they're on their phone. And I think many people um, in the corporate world still believe that like the parents and the people who are the CFOs of the household are Gen Xers or even boomers who didn't grow up with the internet in the household. But that's really no longer the case. Gen Xers are aging out. Um, you know, I'm a Gen Xer and, you know, many Gen Xer friends I have have, have kids that are off to college now. Right. So they're not really the, the CFO of the household anymore. And, and the Gen Xers are being replaced. But as the traditional parent is the millennial. So the parent is different. The parent is a millennial. The parents on their phone all the time. And the parents are getting influenced by influencers um, in social platforms. 
Uh, 77% are likely to engage with a financial insurance brand that's promoted by an influencer they follow. And we really see this across all industries that the creator economy has had such a profound impact on the way that brands are built, um, on the way that consumers find out about brands. Um, it's less likely to be from a uh, linear advertising on television or really any other traditional form of advertising. People are finding about finding out about brands from other people, um, especially, um, you know, from influencers. So I think that's a, it's a big thing to keep in mind when you're talking about how to actually reach consumers uh, in the financial services space. So um, brand partnerships with these influencers can definitely appeal to key audiences, um, but obviously, and I know financial uh, service companies are, are no stranger to diligence and risk aversion. Um, and I would imagine this is also the case here, but obviously if you are a financial institution and you're looking at creating partnerships with influencers, you need to make sure that they know what they're talking about. You need to make sure that they actually are financially sound themselves. Um, I've read stories about financial influencers actually not having any money. So they're telling everyone how to make money, but they actually haven't been able to figure it out on their own. So um, obviously, as with anything else in the creator economy, there are so many incredible people out there that have gravitas that are able to build trust, but there's also a lot of people who aren't. And it's just something that uh, brands need to keep in mind. So how can finance brands directly connect with consumers? Um, so we've talked to, you know, consumers and they told us what's most important to them. Cause obviously these are topics that, um, allow financial institutions to maybe connect in a deeper way with consumers, um, and start to really add value in their lives. Uh, 38% are, are focused on saving for retirement. So obviously, um, content around that content around saving early, contributing to your 401k, um, you know, contributing up to the max, um, all those things, calculators in terms of how much you're going to save. Those are all things that consumers find incredibly valuable. How to build an emergency fund. Obviously, you know, in, in here in New York City, we had an earthquake um, last week, which is something I never thought I'd see. You never know what's going to happen in this world. And I think all these consumers living through the pandemic, consumers living through the financial crisis of 2008 or their parents struggled through it. Um, I think, you know, many understand that um, building an emergency fund is incredibly important. And I think that's a goal that brand that, that banks can really educate consumers on. And the third are looking to improve their credit score. And obviously that is a quantitative factor um, on how institutions are looking at consumers and, um, you know, how fit they are to borrow whether it's for a car loan or a mortgage. And I think um, that's obviously something that consumers really could continue to be educated about and learn how to, how to build. Um, they also um, express the need for more financial education in the areas around investing um, and saving strategy. As I mentioned earlier, retail investing um, is fast growing. More and more uh, younger consumers want to invest. They want to understand how to buy stocks. They want to understand um, how the stock market and how Wall Street works. And um, investing advice is something that um, there's no shortage of demand in from consumers. Uh, many banks we've seen have already um, instituted financial education programs. Um, but ultimately, what we found through doing our research is that a lot of the information isn't always easy to understand for consumers. Um, a big thing is about breaking down um, a lot of the vernacular and, and, and language in really easy to understand, easy to digestible format. So it can really help consumers um, with the path forward. And sometimes um, banks talk in bank speak and consumers, especially in a social or mobile environment are not kind of in the headspace to be able to consume content that way. So it's really about how do you translate the wealth of information and education and knowledge that these financial institutions have into a form factor, into language that's easily digestible to the target audience. Um, so buy now, pay later is, I think, going to be looked back um, in history as like a, a big kind of marker of our times, which is that in 2000, 2020 and 2021, interest rates were so low money came so easily, you had the rise of these um, buy now, pay later platforms, which really allowed consumers to buy things that they probably couldn't afford. The best example being Peloton. Um, I read somewhere that like over 90% of consumers who bought a Peloton during 2020 and 2021, this is, you're talking about a $3,500 product, right? They bought it through no interest buy now, pay later financing, where it was like $100 a month for three or four years. 
And without that, many probably wouldn't have bought it, right? Because how many consumers can really just plop down $3,500 without thinking about it um, spur of the moment? And many of them did. And now many people have Pelotons that are great hangers for their clothes um, in their garage, guilty, right? So many people have bought them and have not used them because they're going outside to exercise and they're not stuck at home anymore. And it's it's not just Pelotons that were purchased. It's so many products out there um, that, or maybe a consumer would want to buy a pair of jeans, but for the same cash outlay of that visit at the e-commerce site, they could buy six pairs of jeans. And yes, they'd be paying that same price over the course of a year or two that they were going to pay that day. But you know, YOLO, right? Live in the moment. So I think we start to see a lot of this. And now there's a lot of talk about, well, is there a, a kind of a credit risk or bubble coming out of buy now, pay later? Um, you know, and, and is it getting kind of consumers over their skis? Um, now, obviously, in some ways, this is no different than credit cards, although many credit card companies um, obviously don't allow you to term out the the expenses um, the way that, 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 you know, buy now, pay later platforms do. Um, but it definitely has ushered in a ton of incremental spending. Um, a, a lot of retailers and, and, and merchants have, have greatly benefited from this new financial instrument. The question is, is it going to be looked at five, 10 years from now as a good thing for the consumer, as a good thing for business? Um, I think it remains to be seen. But you know, it was once a niche product, and now it's really normal for young people to use it in daily essentials because these um, buy now pay later platforms have done a great job at integrating into the buying experience for consumers in many places they shop. So whether they're buying concert tickets or vacations, you know, many consumers say, "Oh, I want to go to that Beyonce concert," but tickets are a thousand dollars on eBay. Oh, but I'm only paying $60 a month for the next, um, you know, three years. Uh, I could swing that. And I'm just going to do it. Where normally they wouldn't do it. And what that does is it keeps the prices of those Beyonce tickets high because it makes it more accessible to the consumer. But it also starts to bubble up more and more debt for consumers. And now they have to pay that off before they pay off their credit card. And then their credit card starts to grow. And with rising interest rates, that starts to accumulate. And that's how so some of these sort of habits really can start to to, um, to end up in a bad place. Um, for consumers, many consumers who haven't had to contend with this before. Um, so that's going to be interesting moving forward. And ultimately, the way out of this is obviously for consumers to curb spending, but for ultimately wages and wage growth to outpace the, 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 the growth of inflation and the cost of goods. And to date, that really hasn't happened. In fact, just yesterday, we saw that inflation continues to rise. Um, there's a lot of talk about the Federal Reserve cutting interest rates um, here in 2024. And now people aren't so short it's going to happen anymore because the Federal Reserve needs to keep interest rates high as a tool to curb inflation. And if inflation continues to run hot, then, then the Federal Reserve is going to be in no rush to lower interest rates, uh, which is something that a lot of people, I think, were counting on this year. Um, so they could sell that home and finance a new home. Um, it looks like that's being pushed further out um, right now. So among those respondents who cited debt as a financial difficulty, obviously, and this is no surprise, it goes to what I'm talking about, 80% say credit card debt is their most common challenge. And credit card debt, um, if not controlled, especially in a world of rising interest rates, can be a, a tough thing for consumers to contend with, especially as they don't want to cut their expenses, they don't want to curb their lifestyle, um, but interest rates keep growing, their cost of service debt, that just grows every single month, even if they're not adding new um, new balance to, to their credit card. So that's something that consumers really need to contend with and, and really understand. Um, at the same time, credit cards are driving loyalty programs that are quite appealing to consumers. Um, you know, they have up the ante. What, what we start to see with like airlines, for example, is airlines are rewarding people less now for flying on planes and they're rewarding more for people using their co-branded credit cards, right? Because that's a very high margin business for them. Um, and as a result, um, you know, a lot of airlines are saying you can still get status on our airline if you don't fly it a lot. Just use our co-branded credit card. And, you know, because because the interest rates are so high, the margins are so good um, on these products that it actually makes more sense. And, and that becomes another lucrative business. So, um, you know, credit cards are definitely appealing and many credit card products are great products. But again, just like any other product, it has to be used responsibly. Um, so brands definitely have, um, you know, the opportunity to incentivize consumers to set long-term financial goals, to understand um, what the future looks like relative to the world they're seeing today and the world in which they're spending in today. 
And then lastly, you know, wouldn't be a presentation in 2024 if we didn't talk about AI. And um, AI really should be a huge beneficiary to consumers to understand where their spending is going. I think AI is going to play a huge role in everything from accounting in terms of how consumers are going to um, file their taxes and how they're going to, um, you know, maybe um, itemize their expenses and, and, and find um, tax write-offs and things of that nature to leveraging AI for, um, for financial advice and financial advisory and, and, and building custom AI GPTs that understand a consumer, understand their income, understand their credit score, and can help them make decisions of how much they should spend on a car and a house. I think we're going to be entering a whole new era in financial management and financial wellness um, and financial advisory driven through AI. And that's really going to take off over the next couple of years. We'll probably evolve slower than other industries just because, you know, financial services is a highly regulated um, industry. And as a result, some of this AI based technology may be slow out of the gate, but eventually I think we all know where this is headed in terms of AI's role, increasing role in consumers everywhere in their lives. But I think that it's definitely going to hit the financial services space and ultimately could be a really good thing uh, for consumers. So that's um, all we have today. I know that we have um, some questions. Uh, so I'm going to go through some questions really quickly. The first of which, so Lauren, she said, when you say Instagram generation, can you see, can you mean Gen Z or millennials? I would say an Instagram generation isn't really a you know, a definitive term, but I would say the Instagram generation is really millennials and Gen Z is more the TikTok generation. Um, if I had to actually, and I would say um, Gen X is more, is more so the Facebook generation. Um, if I had to um, put it and maybe my, the MySpace generation, but I think that's kind of how uh, I put it. Um, Nancy thought that um, they migrated Mint users to Credit Karma. That is true, but it's completely different functionality. Um, so I think it, it, it does not do what Mint did, um, as a financial tool. Um, and there's another tip too, that quick and simplifies a really good tool. So thank you for that. So, um, those are all the questions and comments I had. I just want to thank you guys for joining. We will be sending out a recording, uh, of today's webinar. And of course, um, us and the team at Suzy are always happy to help, um, in terms of helping you understand any of the trends we spoke about today. So I hope everyone has a great spring, um, and hope to see everyone soon. So thanks so much. And, uh, talk to you guys real soon. Bye-bye.